Before that, I need to salute this great institution for the great spirit of a higher idea of academics. Whenever I come to this institution, this is my third coming. The first was in 2014, as Ramo said, for delivering a talk on neglected memories and untold histories. And now, and uh, day before yesterday, I came with Dr. Sibichan uh, to hear his talk. And today I am here to deliver a talk on environmental history. I can tell you with utmost certainty that what the nation is wanting these days is uh, this type of interventions in the society. You have to restore this, not the endangered species I am speaking, the endangered spaces. I hope you are getting me the public sphere. It's only because of the public sphere that changes had happened all over the world. It is because of the public sphere in the 18th century that French Revolution occurred. Had there been no public sphere, there would have been no French Revolution. Had there been no public sphere, there would have been no independence for India in that sense. So JIPA is playing a very significant role these days. And when I am looking at you for this Monday in the evening, you know, in spite of your busy schedule, you have come to hear a lecture on the environment. That shows the spirit. So my salutations before you for this uh, wonderful evening and giving company for me. Now, uh, let me start uh, before, um, you know, proceeding to my lecture. I will tell you what all things I am going to say as part of this lecture, which is schematized into three parts. The first part is on the general, uh, what do you call, attitudes towards environment, defining environment if it is possible to define environment. And the second part is to look at a particular case where Indian environment was discovered or rediscovered by the colonial government. And the third to reflect on the present day developmental drive, the so-called developmental drive of the nation state. These are the three parts. Before proceeding to the first part, what the picture that is displayed on the screen is a, a, a picture that is used by Thomas Kuhn, who was a professor of science in Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. And he happened to walk through the veranda while some history class was going on in the auditorium, in the lecture hall. He entered the room and sat there for some time and decided to join for uh, doing a course in history. And he wrote a wonderful book named The Structure of Scientific Revolution. He differentiates between normal science and revolutionary science using the term paradigm shift. Paradigm shift. So in order to show that I am, you know, I have used this clipping, uh, which speaks, Kuhn used the duck-rabbit optical illusion. I think most of you may be knowing this. The optical illusion to demonstrate the way in which a paradigm shift could cause one to see the same information in an entirely different way. So why are you looking at the environment in an entirely different way these days? Why there happened a shift from the 1970s onwards for the entire global community looking at the environment and thinking that something bad is happening? The concept of spaceship, spaceship the concept of planetary consciousness, everything emerged from that. How paradigms create changes. Paradigms means a mental framework within which you think. Do you think that your thinking is your own thinking? No. Very difficult. Your thinking is controlled, conceived and designed by a mental frame of the period, which is, uh, in the words of Michel Foucault, it is the episteme. Episteme means an order, a thought process which is guiding you in a thinking. So paradigm, how paradigm changes? One interesting thing, while interacted with my friend in Cochin, which is now a, something like a, 
a cyber city like Bangalore, where people think in terms of the computers and internet, where humane, humaneness is not seen, where communication gap is seen instead of, in spite of the communication revolution, a boy, a girl, a girl, a little girl of uh, four years, she was st she's staying in a flat in Cochin. They are in a 24-story flat. And her parents, both of them are softy, softy, software engineers, every time busy with their uh, schedule and all. So the, ch the child seldom gets time to communicate with them, to familiarize with the parents in that sense. She is being brought up by an ayah. And from the 24th story, you know, of the building, through the window, she is looking downwards and saying, oh, this is the earth. You know? Far away from the earth, you know. And uh, one fine day, she was taken to a place called Marthandam, that is uh, near Trivandrum, uh, between uh, Trivandrum and Kanyakumari, a place called Marthandam, which is uh, her mother's uh, house is located there. And the child was seen playing with her uh, cousins, you know, friends, and uh, splashing through the muddy water, uh, you know, and running and uh, making all such celebrations, you know, with the, with the children and the, uh, you know, people uh, around. Immediately, the girl came to, rushed towards her mother and said, pointing to something, she said, Mama, look, a walking chicken. So she's seeing a chicken for the first time. A walking chicken. Because within that closed environment, she was looking only at the KFC, where you can see the chicken is a commodified thing, you know. It is part of the commodity fetishism culture. She is subjected to that. So thereby she is getting alienated from her own environment in some sense to greater extent. That's what Ramu was telling me, sharing with me. The harmonious relationship that our people, the humans, had with nature in the old days is not seen here, but that is again problematic. What sort of harmonious relationship? I, as an environmental history uh, teacher, I am doubtful about that also. But we need to historicize that. So what I am trying to say is the story of a paradigm shift. Uh, take my views as perspectives, not as ultimate you know, truth or uh, judgment in that sense. Uh, this is a historical perspective where that's why I opened this uh, uh, lecture with this uh, optical illusion slide of Thomas Kuhn. He used uh, the duck-rabbit illusion to demonstrate how when such a shift occurs, you are suddenly able to see and understand a thing, a phenomena, a set of data, differently despite the fact that you are still looking at exactly the same thing as before. You are looking at the river the same thing as before. It is said that it is the dharma of the river to keep flowing. Why are you restricting the dharma of the river? I forgot the Upanishad. It is written, it is the dharma of the river to keep flowing. And for the sake of development, you are building dams? Is it true? What is the perspective? What is your idea? We need development. We need electricity. We need to irrigate. So, let me look at the history part of that. Let me try to historicize this. Uh, which in some way or other may help you in understanding the present environmental perils. Uh, both horizontally and vertically. I mean. So my topic is uh, exploring environmental history of the nation, colonial and post-colonial trajectories. So environment, I told you, it's a very, very ambiguous term. Environment can be one thing to one person, another thing to another person, one thing to one political system, another to another political system, to a nation, different nations, environment co differs, communities, environment differs. But let me divide, classify human's relation with nature into four parts, phases. One is, as, you, as all of you, it is a hunting-gathering phase, isn't it? So there it is said that people lived in harmony with nature. Why? People lived in harmony with nature. You have to take other factors also like technology, economy, social organization and ideology. The technology was very poor, right? And the 
social organization was very powerful in some sense because there were certain coercive you know rules sets of, sets of rules which used to act as constraints on human activities in the area and their knowledge of understanding the knowledge about a particular environment was very limited only some trees only a river only some animals so what they did and the nature was mysterious so the the capricious the nature was capricious there was hidden truth in the nature they were not able to uncover such truth so this type of a mindset you know definitely you know added some sort of a sacredness to the environment within which they lived so some of the trees became very sacred some of the forested spaces became you know spaces where gods resided so they never used to enter into that and they had their own prescriptions like you know not to hunt a particular animal or not to fish in a river during the breeding time of the fishes so it's actually it is not a conservation a very you know conservation from ebu but it was a conservation from the community itself you know so some sort of a reverential attitude and the total ecological impact was very very limited in that sense there was no ecological problems environmental pollution nothing like that in the hunting gathering period i am taking you know these things in a very speedy manner because i am going to concentrate on colonialism and the second phase as all of you know is nomadic pastoralism people used to move from one place to another place isn't it so they came into contact with new biota new animals you know new rivers new mountains so the uh, the knowledge terrain of the people you know got expanded right with every additional incremental knowledge about nature humans became confident that if the species end there if there is some sort of a shortage there you can move to this place and this idea of new areas were transmitted to the hunting gathering societies by the nomadic pastorals and the hunting gatherers hunter gatherers also started moving from one place to another place and this is also a time when the technology got advanced because of the use of animal energy speed gained speed with gaining speed the extraction of natural environment also speeded up paced up so and this environmental historian consider this phase as the phase when people started thinking apart from nature some sort of an apartheid you know we are superior we are away from the given nature the rest of the thing the other they started signifying the rest of the world as the other so some sort of hegemonic what you call attitude of people got developed at this particular stage nomadic pastoralism and the environmental impact you know slightly went up slightly went up because you know utilization of uh, natural resources in different areas with gaining speed they started speedily extracting natural resources like that you know it paced up that's the second stage in human history and the third stage and you are sure about the third stage you know there is a stage which uh, marked a revolution in agriculture hmm? that is the settled agriculture phase people started settling in one area settling in one area means over utilization of the resources in a given area and as a matter of fact you know the problem with you know fertility of the soil got decreased so people invented fertilizers slowly slowly they started producing more markets emerged market economy decided what sort of products are to be produced and slowly urban centers developed together with that you can see the emergence of state systems in india like the mauryas the mauryas and for the first time in the history of india a separate department for the environment not exactly for environment was you know constituted set up by devanam piya piya deshi raja ashoka ashoka the great monarch you know he established a particular department which is not the environment department but a forest department and a person a designated officer by name kuppiya tyaksha was appointed to oversee all forest administration and he considered that assertion of the state monopoly is very important so he made the restrictions on you know some sort of activities resource extraction in some forest which were uh, not reserved in that sense which belonged to the emperor as such royal forest the idea of royal forest which got elaborately extended during the time of the guptas golmigas and vanpalas a series of officers were appointed by the guptas 
so you can see slowly slowly the state as is asserting the right over the natural environment the forest which led to some sort of an alienation of the people living inside the forest so the wild came to be treated as something you know very difficult difficult to be disciplined you know some sort of a taming exercise some sort of in a government mentality emerged at this stage then i am skipping reached to the mughal the mughals you know they had a particular you know forest policy because they wanted to utilize the teak timber for building boats great ships so there are reserved reserve the trees some of the forests were you know were uh, <coughs> set to fire during the war times and uh, the hunting of the moguls is very important uh, perhaps you may be knowing that the most endangered species in uh, india there is not even a single cheetah you can find cheetah you know cheetah why irfan habib in one of his one of his work the man and environment in india he is of the opinion that it is because of the mughal government that the cheetah are now an endangered species in india why because the cheetahs were used as hunting animals you know for the mughal hunting because the mughal hunting was a large expedition like thing the entire palace was going into the forest you know and the king was shooting eh, the animals the lion tiger or whatever be the animal which come which come across and cheetahs assisted the king the company of the king and cheetahs never breed in captivity that irfan habib suggests as the most important reason for the endangerment of cheetah species in india cheetah and then came the colonial government the british now we are going to concentrate on that in what way they invented indian environment in what way they reconfigured the landscape of india by using a rationality which was totally different from the rationality of the earlier governments the scientific rationality intervention of science scientism procedural you know uh, working management of natural resources of india so my reference points point uh, points for this lecture are travels botanics scientific knowledge creation law making the people on the margins assertion of power and ecological imperialism these concepts which i am going to develop explicate for your understanding how india was invented in those times you know india was invented through basically through travels complete you know organized travels all over india europeans you know they were coming in groups you know and they were traveling the entire of india international it was not an india then i don't i don't not use the term india then but the region where we live and they were an integral part in the process of tropicalization of india so travel constituted uh, an important methodology of the english of the europeans in general for understanding and making a particular notion of knowledge about the indian environment travel tropicalization i will explain what is tropicalization it is a western way of defining something culturally and politically alien as well as environmentally distinct from europe and other parts of temperate zone so the british one day when they came the europeans when they came to india they wanted to create you know india or to project india into the minds of the other europeans as a different zone this is a process of othering in what way the other is to be described why the other is different from us why the forest why the environment of india is different from ours was the integral part in the tropicalization process of the europeans and they used to impose their knowledge on us you know because we were defined we were culturally defined by the european as per their perspectives isn't it it's a matter of perspective in that sense you know it's a perspectival understanding about india so european so to impose their own understanding of the landscape upon india and understanding derived from europe i will explain this and at this time also developed you know the science of british india especially natural sciences had there been no botany especially economic botany there would have been no british empire in india because botany and botanists assisted the making of the empire there is a 
inextricably interlinked connection between botany and empire building so science of india especially natural science especially botany evolved symbiotically with the travel in ways that were mutually constitutive every additional you know information about the biota of india was very well documented for the first time you know the history of india was documented by the british you know and we have difference of opinion about that they say that indians had no sense of the past indians had no history india is totally an historical continent in that sense they said why it is because of their notion of history as an understanding of a linear history process that is starting from 1 to 100 when you reach 100 it is a modern european history progress everything prior to that is backward you know savage or uncivilized like that it's a linear notion of time they brought progress the 100th the 100th landmark is the progress which was brought by european science and technology that's a linear time consciousness which is you know counter argued by historians like romila tapar and all at all saying that indians had a sense of a cyclical view of history isn't it cyclical so it is a higher plane historical knowledge for us because our history was not externalized it was embedded in myths genealogies charita literature and all these people were not understanding that europeans you know so they naturally they thought that this is all you know some sort of you know myths like that myth nothing to uh, understand history history is not history proper is not there there is no chronology nothing but our history was entirely different it was a philosophizing kind of history the epistemology historical epistemology the indians were simply different from that you know that is why the indian conceptions conceptualizations about nature was misconceived by these people and subordinated the indian knowledge to the european epistem that is the umbrella the mental framework of their thinking you know so in that way indian notions about the inner environment got subverted it got brought under the umbrella of the european notions of science and progress science european if european science is there you can have progress so it this is considered as a traveling gaze gaze is again a term which is used by i think some of you may be knowing this person michel foucault you know michel foucault you know a great philosopher who died in 1984 due to aids he is a postmodern philosopher historian who extensively wrote on uh, newer themes like madness and civilization history of sexuality birth of the modern medicine that is uh, how the hospitals emerged you know things like that he uses the term gaze no one no institution no political system prior to the british had such a gaze when they looked at the environment the forest they found the environment how this is to be brought under their control the gaze there is a deeper penetrative look into into the natural environment where everything got brought under the system of government which again foucault uses as governmentality how to manage these resources for the benefit of the empire because in 1857 you know the first war of indian independence or sepoy mutiny after that immediately the queen declared that uh queen's proclamation is there where there is an exactly this sentence is there i i found this sentence in the proclamation in uh, uh, national archives when i visited the archives here after all natural resources of india will be owned and managed by her majesty's government you know so the particular sentence was written so how indian resources were brought under the utilitarian context of the british empire is a process that this is a gaze the gaze was so deep and profound that every plant of india every tree of india every animal of india every resources of india was brought under their investigation perhaps you may be knowing about the madhav gadgil report you know which was published some 2 3 years before in 1848 the british empire published the first report on western ghats which is known as the edward green balfour report which you know it's actually more than 1000 pages balfour report about the western ghats even about the grasses about the type of soils in india so very well documented and why did they document what's the use of documenting all these resources for knowledge making for increasing our knowledge about india for writing more books reports knowledge is power ultimately this knowledge will be used by the government british government i will i will i will i'll show you uh, 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 i'm sorry
so india was interpreted in relation to perception values that were largely external to itself and alien to its history and culture india was interpreted different from that of india and in another india was interpreted the result was another india not the india which was in existing existence in those times but another india according to the value system of the english especially the english all this knowledge and this is the way you know documentation is there reports are there travels are there everything got codified into reports like systematically embodied in censuses gazetteers ethnographic surveys and administrative manuals everything even most of the plans you know you know information about the plans the plans of india got copied into the pharmacopoeia the european pharmacopoeia most of the plans you know are gaining the name the honorific is getting their honorific is the european name so they are known by the scientists which the botanists which uh, who discovered the particular plant for example it can be humboldt you know humboldt or hooker so everything was you know uh, interpreted in their science in their labs all this knowledge by the travelers in all kinds later became systematically embodied in censuses gazetteers ethnographic surveys and administrative manuals so by 1860s and 70s as colonial governmentality took firm hold the age of this science is called as itinerant science because the science which traveled all over india and became a science only through traveling modality that the science got codified and the traveling is almost over by the 1870s now what is the next so tropicalization eventually became part of oriental scholarship presenting india as a very backward and undeveloped or savage space that has to be disciplined and civilized so this is the ultimate you know objective india is backward it needs to be modernized it is pre modern all the governments prior to the british were pre modern governments they were not looking at the forest in a in a scientific manner in a systematic manner so this is to be put right you have to use science scientific rationality for bringing all these under a firm official structure so officialization happened pursuant to this ultimately they saw the other in indian nature and justified the cause of progress so botany and empire making in this sense was based on the idea of tropicalization and progress and the botany in those times was not the botany which you see today it is biotechnology today so but the botany of those times was really economic botany economic botany how to uh, enrich the foundations of the empire economically by using the botanical sciences now here the second part is i just want to show you a case a case where a wild plant was brought to india for saving colonialism and this is a case of the cinchona hunting cinchona you may be knowing the plant the cinchona and here you can see how the plant hunting apart from other hunting how plants were hunted for colonialism to regain its health this is you know a cinchona there is a red bark cinchona that is preserved in the royal botanic gardens in kew in london even now it's there a cinchona the, the bark the bark you know which changed the course of european history this is a natural bark is a red bark it's known as a red bark and the uses you know actually basically how the traditional knowledge you know got transmitted in the, with the colonizer that's the thing cinchona was grown only in the andean forest it is known as the peruvian bark only in peru you find cinchona and the red indians while uh, to combat malaria they used to eat the leaves and you know the bark of this uh, cinchona and while the spanish missionaries when they reached the uh, peru they came in contact with the red indians and they got the knowledge that this cinchona is good for combating you know treating malaria or wild fever and this news got transmitted to spain and from spain it transferred to other areas and people started looking at this andean forest as a repository for cinchona and uh, if you look at the uses of cinchona apart from uh, as a as a preventive you know uh, prophylaxis for fever malaria 
uh, as a tonic and astringent it's valuable for influenza neuralgia and debility large and two constant doses must be avoided as they produce headache giddiness and deafness the liquid extract is useful as a cure for drunkenness the powdered bark is often used in tooth powders owing to its astringency but not much used internally except as a bitter wine it creates a sensation of warmth but sometimes causes gastric intestinal irritation cinchona in decoction is a useful gargle and a good throat astringent so the knowledge which was there with the red indians you know while it transmitted to the europeans it got elaborated they studied about that bark and they came to understand that this can be used for many diseases you know to restore health and now at this time the fortunes of the europeans were threatened in africa and asia because of the great disease malaria colonialism was stranded between death and the disease death the ultimate reality and disease malaria what happened there was that the european expansion into the interiors of africa and asia was obstructed by a disease malaria which was earlier known as swamp fever and also by other names malaria mal air bad air it has killed more people than all the wars more than all the plagues even the black death only after it had become it had been overcome could other technological advances become effective for the consolidation of the colonial empires you know the scramble for africa the end of africa was divided among different european nations in the 1790s among the first year european military settlement in west africa the death rates ranged from 46 to 76 72% One study for the years 1817 to 1836 found the death rates per annum of the British soldiers in Britain to be 1.53 percent in Britain, whereas in Sierra Leone it was 48.3 48.3 percent, and in the Gold Coast 66.83 percent. This was the case with the other colonial powers also. In some cases, the entire of the exp- expeditions, you know, they lost for uh, this malaria. The, in some expeditions, all the European crew lost their lives. so conquering malaria was viewed as a necessary development for european settlement in the tropics how to combat this how to conquer malaria otherwise colonialism cannot proceed so the demand for basically the demand came from the dutch and the english and there was there was a great competition for this plant from the dutch and the british they were vying with each other for taking this plant from a uh, andean forest that is a peru to england and also to holland so they used the plant hunters you know plant hunters not botanists they were sent to other sent to the andean forest and uh, the cinchona trees were widely destroyed during this time and they effectively hunted the trees and they were brought to kew royal botanic gardens in kew and see one thing happened it needs a particular you know humidity and uh, uh, particular climate for the cinchonas to develop to grow so that was not there in england that is not there in europe nowhere in the world it was good for cinchona plantation so where to grow it now the traveling itinerant signs came for the help of the english and they found that the best place suitable place for the cinchona growing plantations is india nilgiris utakamant so they got established a plantation there in naduvattam and uh, dodabatta plantations and they produced maximum singona planted maximum singona singona plantations you know they started even in kerala munnar you know munnar they started in singona plantations and they produced the singona natural bark it was exported in factories it was made into converted into tablets and these tablets were exported to taken to africa and malaria was defeated so using indian soil using indian environment they developed a plant from the andean forest in india produced the singona bark produced the quinine tablet and succeeded in establishing colonial empires in rest of the world especially in africa and other parts of asia so this is an example where you see just the first part of my presentation that the success the result of tropicalization you know understanding of indian environment was essential for them to in the onward march of colonialism in india the first plantation was suggested in 1813 
uh, it was in h paddington's report they were uh, trying to understand which all areas are suitable for uh, uh, and even himalayas you know singona you know the first singona plantation started in darjeeling but it failed due to climatic changes all the singonas were killed in the cold winter so search for new spaces the medical board of government of india suggested the making of experiments on a wider scale in india in 1855 and colonel markham is a person who took singona plants from andean forest to uh, nilgiris and justified uh, that it was not a case of biopiracy but for saving lives of the people markham's journey into uttarakhand with his wife defeating all adversities i read markham's uh, diary while i was in royal botanic gardens in kew it is written we shall be four or five day on the road riding all the way and it seems to me that we are either eaten by tigers or trampled by wild elephants he wrote so it was under such conditions that this plant was brought to nilgiris you look at the struggles taken by these people because the motive was great the means was not there so the motive of the empire to continue with the with the with the expeditions with the explorations was there which triggered the events you know these are all events you know these people they were actually working for the empire this is a map which which is showing you know the export the transportation of singona you can see that uh, uh, red mark red mark you can see that that is from peru the singona plants were taken to england q you can see england q and then see this is the thing from the andean forest it was taken to royal botanic gardens and from royal botanic gardens you see it crossed the african continent and then it reached india nilgiris here and this is the dutch route they also took this uh, singona and then from there it went to south east asia there and based java sumatra and borneo but this is the line particularly relating to the singona expedition of the english they they made some experiments here and the singona was taken in a particular case which is known as a wardian case because 24 days was the time limit for reaching india from uh, london those days so otherwise the singona the trees will lose its uh, health it will be spoiled so in a wardian case which uh, i will show you the case which which contains a particular moisture uh, humidity it was taken to india and it was grown in india in nilgiris just look at the look at the motive which triggered this this transportation the motive was great motive was for profit you know basically for uh, the engagement the, the for the profit of the core country that's a small country that's england so in 1983 you can see that uh, singona uh, that is a red bar that's that's why this red red bar this is the best uh, suitable but the best one for producing quinine that's why they took maximum from andean forest and while reaching nilgiris markham wrote his wrote in his diary here are to be found a climate an amount of moisture a vegetation and an elevation above the sea more analogous to those of the singona forest in south america that can be met with any other part of india so the production was very lucrative very profitable that a singona the nilgiris bark defeated the andean bark in london auctions and most of the contractors there is a traders were only europeans none other one none, none other one was permitted to trade in singona it is an absolute monopoly for the european trader and markham's exploration of travancore cochin and padani hills also apart from nilgiris he also came to kerala and uh, he tried uh, with this plant in uh, padani in cochin near cochin uh, he planted it in uh, munnar the first tea plant the first plantation in munnar was no tea but it was singona and this is markham's expedition uh, you can see that the entire of the entire this is this is the line he goes like this and then he comes back through kottayam tekadiyan kumli he reaches the padani hills you know but it was found uh, not that productive so it was taken to a place called munnar where it was you know widely grown the first uh, singona plantation in kerala and the botanical garden at uttakaman at this time botanical gardens were you know actually they were laboratories you know they were not simply gardens laboratories for uh, conserving and uh, getting you know plants acclimatized to a different environment and this is the first uh, this is the first plant uh, 
the the nursery which was developed in the nadvattam plantation in utakkam i think there is one village even in uti now the singona village succeeded in opening in plantations at utakkam and nadvattam and dodabatta you can see the fully grown singona tree it's an old photograph taken from nadvattam plantation so nilgiri bark you know it started fetching maximum price in london slowly gave way to the opening of private plantations now private individuals also started planting apart from the government initiatives so the plant transfer what is the focal point of my argument is that so the plant transfer was symbolically and ideologically was very significant you can see the transformation of a wild tree into a cultivated crop you know a medicinal crop because of the use of botanical sciences how science go transform this wild tree how it tamed the discipline the tree for uh, producing for the british economy in that sense and who coordinated all these transfers the royal botanic gardens at kew the power house of economic botany in those times and how did they transfer the plant in wardian case or it's also known as a waltonian case you can see this is the case you know where you know uh, it, it's it's a glass and wooden piece case you can see that singona plants were uh, fully stored in this in this uh, particular waltonian case and transferred to india it took 24 days as i as i told you perfectly retained you know about 200 uh, plants were you know put in one uh, one case uh, and uh, 70 to 75% of the trees were perfectly in uh, perfectly healthy while it reached nilgiris and now what do you think of what is the use of this for the environmental history to understand so the location i am taking you to one location one it is africa and asia the motive started there you know the need to transform somebody's environment the need for plant transfer started in africa and asia because they confronted the disease they confronted death second is a location in q where they got all laboratory exp- experiments you know royal botanical gardens they experimented with the uh, singona plant you know its uh, derivatives uh, they try to understand the particular area where this strand will be grown uh, the, the trees will be grown and the third location is the peruvian andean forest the traditional knowledge the tra- they got use of the traditional knowledge and it was converted into modern medicine medical knowledge and location 4 is utakamand in colon in india and location so these travels of these plant hunters the q garden the botanical gardens in india plantations factories and the techs they were actually sites of power that is my argument sites of power they consider they, they were important segments in european power the entire process was one through which colonial imperial economic botany triggered certain events that created scientific knowledge for the retention of the power of the empire this is a basic argument that i am putting in front of you like michel fugo says once knowledge can be analyzed in terms of region domain implantation transposition one is able to capture the process by which knowledge functions as a form of power and disseminate the effects of power so knowledge is power what is the use of this itinerant science why did they travel all over india why did they document why did they drafted reports why did they write diaries everything constituted you know important knowledge elements constituents for the expansion of the empire because the empire was triggering all these events these individual as well as the institutional advancements you know were directed coordinated for the empire the events therefore the events which we have witnessed like the travels the singona hunting etc are not mere surface disturbances you cannot consider it as mere events but were produced within the context of geography and power politics nature is a key variable in understanding history in that sense if indian ocean was different indian history would have been different right if mediterranean was different the history of the european continent would have been different how the oceans played how the deserts played how the plants played an important role in shaping the history of the human human kind human civilization and in india the site where all these knowledges were used for a colonial state apparatus as i told you the forest the domain of forest they came to india they looked at you know the tribals the jhum cultivation the slash and burn cultivation and the forest managers the conservators said that you know this is the most disastrous engagement that is the jhum cultivation 
that the tribals are engaging in gym cultivation and you know they are causing havoc for the forest we need to systematically coordinate the management of the forest there you can see the birth of forestry science in india german foresters were recruited in india and they were asked to manage the indian forest for the management of indian forests and research for the first time a forest research institute was instituted in dehradun and do you know the first duty that was assigned to the forest research institute was to develop best quality sleepers for british indian railways this is the paradox this is a dichotomy so this paradox you know why because they were wanting to have enough tectona grandis there is a teak timber from the interior of indian forest so it was very difficult to procure extract these teak trees when the tri uh, tribes or adivasis are there inside the forest so they need to be secluded so they said that we are going to introduce scientific forestry they always use the honorific scientific forestry they said that we are going to introduce scientific forestry in india for the management conservation of forest and they introduced it and they passed the first forest act in india in the year 1865 and they got almost all the good forest reserved that is the politics of reservation so none of the people in india were able to resist this this is for preservation isn't it and adivasis also were you know they were also indoctrinated to believe that this is for preservation and conservation so the adivasis or the tribal people who were living inside the forest inside a life world of their own with their life world rationality started thinking in terms of the rationality of the colonizer why the tactics of the colonial government you see these people were recruited in large uh, groups to work as coolies gangsmen inside the forest department so while they became coolies and gangsmen inside the forest department what was abnormal for them up to those days became normal normalization of abnormality routinization officialization so they also started to think in terms with the colonial state and some of them differed and that is where you can see the resistance from the santals the bills the gons the corkus and all that resisted there you can see something like if you if you look at indian national politics you can see the element of environment there also why did the adivasis the poor peasants of india resisted the british forest policy it is because of loss of habitat loss of habitat challenge to their domain or the habitats you know so you can see some sort of an element of nationalism which modern environmental historians you know comment they say of it as ecological nationalism whereas you can see that what is the design of the colonizer it was part of ecological imperialism reconfiguration of the landscape according to the whims and fancies of the colonial government so there was a contestation confrontation between you look at champaran satyagraha of mahatma gandhi in 1970 can you see the roots of ecological nationalism there gandhi struggled the first satyagraha of gandhi was against ecological imperialism that is against monoculture plantations the ideology was there the secret of his satyagraha the politics of his satyagraha was against the monopolization of land resources of india by the british compulsory cultivation of indigo because indigo was wide was in wide demand for the cotton textile industry for the dye works they were not able to proceed without indigo so that is why they forced the act so you can see that the element of ecological nationalism which gandhi used in the champaran in 1917 was used by the poor men of india the adivasis even prior to that just to refer to the santal the bills the gonds the korku rebellions and protest against the british government because you see while reserving the forest they were uh, for, they were you know they were putting impositions and restrictions on the hunting practices of the adivasis they they used to hunt only very limited animals you know like especially the deer nothing more than that because they never hunted the wild the big cats you know like lion or tiger because tiger they considered as the god of the forest the kadavul they without understanding that they constituted an a major chain in the food chain you know major uh, factor in food chain they were not knowledgeable about that but they know that a healthy tiger reflects a healthy forest the adivasis understood this so tigers are to be preserved and conserved 
So that was their knowledge. But the Europeans, they imposed all sorts of restrictions on colonial tribal hunting. And this was actually a hunting of the body of the poor men in India. For the progress, for the colonial government's progress, the body of the Adivasi was hunted. That's the relationship between body hunting, the physical body hunting of the Adivasi. Because the, uh, this non-vegetarian food, you know, eh, which they got from this hunting hall, constituted an important element in the dietary practice of the Adivasi. The nutrient was lost. So as a matter of fact, his body was hunted, he became poor. So many people died. This is the result. This, this also led to, in some sense, to man-made famine in India. You can connect it with, you know, this, side, this type of, this intervention of scientific rationality and triggering of the empire, things like that. And then now, after making all these things, what the British gained? Uninterrupted supply of monopoly trees for the introduction and expansion of the railways, for private timber trade across the continents, for the use of the timber for the world, world war one and world war two and also for imperial other exigent requirements so the end result of all this rationality all this systematic management was can be considered as the result of ecological imperialism and in a wonderful work written by alfred crosby it's about the expansion of the colonizer european into australia and new zealand it was virtually an expansion of a different biota for Australia and New Zealand. So neo Europe's were created in Australia and New Zealand. Australia and New Zealand vegetation was entirely changed, reconfigured with the coming of the European vegetation. This is this Crosby terms as ecological imperialism. And the people of New Zealand and Australia were pushed away. So a complete demographic takeover by the European happened in Australia and New Zealand. In India also, except for this demographic expansion, the other type of ecological imperialism happened. For example, you look at a site, I will show you, a site in Kerala, which is, uh, this is these are all, which I discussed, you know, the question of tribals and all, the resistance occurred. Now you see a reordering of the landscape, the, the third process, this is a culture takeover. It's not simply an environmental reconfiguration, but it's a culture takeover. You just to see this, uh, you know, as an example, this photograph reveals a lot. The Europeans came in large numbers for opening tea plantations in Munar, and the worst enemy, the arch enemy of the white planter was tiger. So it used to be killed. So the person who is sitting with the gun, uh, his name uh, is a Ranigar, who showed that 24 tigers in one week's time. 24 tigers. And you can see, you can learn a lot from this photograph. You know, as an environmental historian, I am using this visual records also. You see, the trophy, that is a tiger, it is stretched like this, you know. It is stretched. Looking at the size of the tiger, you can understand the masculine power of the hunter, European hunter. And you can see the, uh, the, the gun in his hands, the cap, the superiority we show, they always use the cap. So, it's a white hunter who conquered the tiger and these, uh, these photographs were sent to Europe in postcards in large numbers. So, it's a dissemination of knowledge, you know. So, while this was seen by people in Europe, they came to know that tigers are hunted, so now we can go to Moon or open plantation like that. The politics of the postcard, you know. And whereas, uh, this was not an individual engagement, so many people were hunting. For example, in Bengal tigers, in Bengal, you know, a large number of tigers were hunted for opening plantations and for clearing forests. Now here you can see one more thing you can understand. I will show you the next picture. An elephant was hunted. And same Ranigar is there. It's very easy to hunt the elephant, you know. Very easy. And you can see that, and in the, and this picture is not there. In the second picture, the elephant, when it was hunted, he got all the Adivasis, especially a particular community in Kerala, Mutuans. They came and sat on the uh, elephant, you know. 25 to 30 Mutuans sat on the elephant, showing the strength of the European. But never with the tiger's body. Only the European was permitted to pose for photograph with the tiger's trophy. Why? Because it is his absolute monopoly. No, Mutuan was permitted to 
pose for a photograph with the tiger but when i interviewed some muduvans they told me that sir it is not like that because tiger tiger is kadavul god so we will never pose for photograph with the dead body of our god that is the response from the muduvans so you see these pictures the politics of the pictures is that they were transmitted all over europe and it was an indication that the wild of india is captured it is discipline it is controlled by the european and his modern gun the victory of modernity in that sense and this is actually you know this exercises in um, colonial biological takeover etc was not simply a biological takeover but it was also a culture takeover this is a sunday meeting of the europeans in 1930s in munar they used to have the scotch whisky and all such you know celebrations and you cannot see a single indian single uh, travancorean here in the photograph nobody was permitted to sit with them so the spaces were the spaces of the european they need to have some type of a refreshment because they are living on the hills they need to have refreshment they need to relax so that's why these clubs played an important role in getting these uh, places you know what do you call becoming gardens the garden logic of the european gardening logic the logic of gardening in environment now you can see they got converted munar if you go to munar it is like this you can see the gymnosperms planted at regular intervals you can see the slopes the tea plantations things like that so this was actually a great solace enjoyment for the eye of the european so aesthetically also it was a source of relaxation for the european so it's a culture takeover it's a biological takeover it's a psychological takeover so the environment of india was reordered not only for the purpose of you know uh, economy or profit making but the europeans they need to sustain their life in india so it is through this process that's why i use the rubric of culture in order to explain this phenomena it's not simply an environmental in that sense it's the rubric of culture everything happened in the fourth phase of human civilization the one being the hunting gathering the second being nomadic pastorals the third being settled agriculture and this is the industrial mode of resource use where the notion of progress was very much there we need to have progress european civilization will bring progress progress on the hills progress in the forest progress in the plains so the indian nation that is the people living in india so you just cannot think about india as of now before 1947 many people in india were thinking you know perhaps that this rule is best for us you know because these people are bringing progress so the notion was not there even though the international movement you know they were planning conceiving things protest movements were there a large section of the people were also thinking in a different manner oh they brought they are bringing railways they are systematically managing their natural resources they are controlling the bestial tribes like ashoka controlled the bestial tribes then what is wrong with their action so such a type of governmentality you know was transforming not only the landscape but the mindscape of the indians there is a connection between the landscape and the mindscape you know the mindscape of the indians you know they were saying oh this is for progress so no need to critic this we need to go on the lines set by the so that is why many planters in india were asking you know we also need uh, indian planters we also need uh, forest for opening plantations but you see in none of the cases they were permitted to open plantations except one or two in cochin about 20 plantations opened from 1890 to 1900 in munar 20 plantations none of the plantations were given for indians in that sense natives by the native maharaja every uh, forested spaces were auctioned and lease agreements were made only with europeans so that is that also shows the the, the secret uh, of uh, ecological imperialism uh, established in india now <coughs> think about the present in industrial mode i don't know what is the time i'm not having a watch with me pardon 7 10 minutes okay oh thank you thank you thank you sir thank you and now the present what do we inherit from the colonial past the developmental drive the developmental drive everywhere recently i was traveling in a bus eh, and two seniors uh, people were sitting in front of me 
uh, and they were talking about development all over kerala and at a particular point of uh, at a particular uh, site you know they stopped and said oh here is no development there is no development in this part and j- then i just just looked through the uh, window i saw that full of trees and you know uh, you know it's wild everything is there that part is not having development the tendency among the people is to cut trees and have development you know the craze of development arising out of a culture which is known as commodity fetishism in cochin uh, I recently two years before a mall a very big mall you know was constructed which you, you may be knowing the lulu mall the lulu mall which is most uh, vociferously promoted by both the congress and the communists you know uh, despite the ideological you know uh, affiliations whatever they are having they promote these type of malls you know this is the culture of the land these days you know like the chicken consciousness of the of the baby eh of the baby you know the chicken is only in the kfc like that not elsewhere and you see half of a river a small river was lost because of this lulu mall people are not concerned about that say we are looking at the spectacle you know the spectacle of lulu mall celebrate the notion of development this is an inheritance which we took directly from the progress notion of the colonial past where you can see that in the initial years of india's making our premier nehru declared that dams are temples of modern india we need dams for irrigation purposes we need dams for uh, power generation for industrialization and he said industrialize or perish where kumarappa said industrialize and perish so what is happening today i am not critiquing nehruvian policy at that point of time because this is only a perspective i told you this is not a judgement in that sense but you look at a specific case i can tell you one important episode which happened in india in the in the contemporary india just take the case of narmada bachavo antolan you know the construction of the sardar sarovar project the second biggest dam in the 30 big dams under the narmada valley project because this is a cluster of dam making in india the nvp comprising of 30 big dams 133 medium dams and 3000 small dams where the protest was against the ssp and people you know they happen to understand about this uh, sardar sarovar project only when the patwari there is a revenue official came to erect the you know the level of the water there in a stone pillar like thing 230 water 230 meter water here and the adivasi the poor people living in the manibeli in madhya pradesh they said oh my god our area is going to be submerged you know they were not knowing about this up to the time of the erection of this pillar <laughs> okay right and then in a beautiful picture you must see this documentary film i recommend this for viewing that is uh, directed by anand patwardhan narmada diary is actually it was shot during this uh, narmada movement the agitation was happening and uh, one media person asked an adivasi uh, why are you uh, doing all this protest you need to sacrifice for the nation and the poor man you know he is not a well educated fellow he is not having a phd not an ma or mphil mba like that thing he replied are we the only people to sacrifice for the nation are we the only people to sacrifice for the nation and the media person was you know he, he simply you know he had no answer for that that is why mehta padkar led the even baba amde led the even poor people led the even it's a people's movement which ramchandra guha calls it as the environmentalism of the indian is the environmentalism of the poor in india whereas in europe it is the environmentalism of the elite because they are protesting for more comforts that sort we are agitating protesting for habitats you know to live dehabitation next to killing a person the worst crime that you can do to somebody is dehabitating him see we feel this when a dam is coming in bangalore no dam will come in bangalore you can all have very good days in bangalore no but no problem but it when when it comes near you when your habitat is uh, challenged then you will be an aggrieved party that's why adivasi is resist, resisted and there is the banner of protest through three different slogans which i need to repeat i need to tell you three different slogans the first slogan was koi nahi hadega bandh nahi banega 
no one is going to move the dam will not be built but they, when they found that it is very difficult to resist through this because they were branded as anti nationals these poor people they were branded as anti nationals so they understood and they changed their politics and they leveled the you know they aired the second slogan which is a very important epistemologically it is a very important political positioning of the poor people vikas chahiye vinash nahi we want development no destruction you can have development but there is no point of taking away our homes the second slogan but you know brutal suppression by the government you know the industrialists the elite classes everyone was with the power the elite people who were for this development but the british was for the progress the development and as a ultimately the adivasi was forced to raise this slogan which is the most you may, you may you may sometimes see it as a very dangerous slogan hamara gaon mein hamara raj self rule in our villages you can understand the perils of the poor people you can understand the politics of the struggles against development through these three slogans there is no need to replicate any other thing no need to explain any other thing one is vikas chahiye vinash nahi that is a political positioning was taken then when they understood that so no no the nation state is suppressing us we are foreigners in the land the better were the days during the british ruled india something like the notion came and they said self rule in our villages hamara gaon mein hamara raj so this can be considered as you know symbolic a sign poster of uh, a microscopic minority the poor people understanding the perils of development i am not saying that you know development is a bad thing development is a good thing we need to develop no doubt about that but development should not be at the cost of dehabitation it should not be at the loss of interest in natural sciences it should not be at the loss of interest in humanities and social sciences now just to think take for example a case from kerala you know a student who is coming to a college or a university most desirous of doing a physics graduation he wants to excel in physics he wants to become an expert in material sciences he ends up his life as a bank clerk this is a utilitarian notion of education highly utilitarian you know education has become very utilitarian that you need to study some things like engineering or management or things like that for certain benefits certain benefits immediate benefits certain outputs nothing more than that that is why history is neglected physics is neglected in all the you know 20 years before history was neglected so physics teachers were not concerned about that they said that most of the students are coming for physics and mathematics now nobody is coming for physics and mathematics everyone is going for engineering biotechnology things like that because biotechnology is the order of the day botany is lost biotechnology is again biotechnology is actually another version of economic botany of the british the value is the value is lost true value what is the knowledge that you are making for economic botany is the knowledge that you are making for biotechnology also now for the sake of you know the environment consciousness we say that organic vegetables things like that you know organic no use of manures now you look at tomatoes are they organic tomatoes you know will sit in the supermarket for one year without losing its freshness you know every time you know like you know there is a there is a quote in uh, marthandorama that is a novel historical novel by c v ramanbull of malayalam where it says that there is a lady like uh, named parukutti parukutti you know with the advancement of her age is again becoming beautiful that is like tomato you know tomato with the advancement of age is becoming more beautiful and robust and uh, a person who was sent to a vegetarian vegetable shop a supermarket for purchasing some organic vegetables by the wife he searched all the way for the vegetarian the vegetables you know organic vegetables he asked the uh, shopkeeper where is the organic vegetable and that fellow was not understanding this and the he simplified this and uh, asked you know i want some vegetables which are not poisoned eh Po- not poisoned are, are you do you have any vegetables which are not poisoned he said no we we are having vegetables if you want you can poison it and give it to your wife <laughs> see see the notions and i am saying that certain inventions are made in the form of what you call or oh, this is good for environment uh, this is good for that and this is good for these things like that the conservation or the strategies of the capitalist industry in saying that this is good genetically modified crops take for example i re- recently read from nature a, the case of a woman in africa namurunda 
she lives in uh, uh, ethiopia eritrea and uh, she lost her husband and uh, he had a, she had a, a three or four children and they were not able to live and genetically modified maize is coming for the help of the lady and she got everything planted with gm gm crops genetically modified and towards the end she landed in great financial strain she lost the land so this is the way in which certain inventories are made for the sake of capitalism this is the way in which culture industry is performing in the world that's why i started the talk with a mental environment which is provided by jipa the public sphere the great public sphere that we are having here because there is no culture industry working in jipa the culture industry is at work outside you go to the channel any channel you will be uh, discussing a corruption problem for 3 days after that a sexual assault problem for another 3 days things like that and you are lost your opinion is not there so that is another environment where your mental makeup the mental frame the paradigm is brought under a set of rules dictated by the market economy that is a real environmental loss that's a culture loss for us with these words i finish uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me once again uh, for delivering a lecture thank you all of you for the patient hearing thank you very much friends if you have any questions or your thoughts on the subject just you have heard you can just come to this stage and say one or two words actually uh, it was very interesting because uh, here in this uh, auditorium we have heard a lot of lectures regarding what our sages and poets explained regarding environment and uh, i think that was a different type of cultural uh, perspective when we go out of this hall we were feeling happy about it but <laughs> when you explain today i am getting a feeling uh, europeans are the worst villains in on this planet because they are the people who have migrated to america and all that and i felt though we have done lot of developments in science and technology i feel they have done equal damage uh, i think uh, that makes me sad and your lecture is very interesting sir and i think uh, what we should do are we uh, taking corrective actions now after 50 i want to know how our politicians and uh, leaders at that time i felt a common man cannot do anything he is helpless it is only the leaders who are having power uh, i think in a particular nation they can uh, do something i want to know are you happy with the steps our leaders have taken in the 50s and 60s and 70s and now are you happy with that are we improving the environment today have we improved the environment in the last 10 years that's what i want to know sir can i respond to this uh, or later So thank you sir thank you for your words of appreciation this is actually not uh, you know something like a, a cinematic villain or hero the europeans were not the villains but they were real heroes in that sense in those days i, I was explaining why is implicating you know the, the 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 relationship between power and knowledge making in that sense that's why i started the travels you know travels is very common it is not it is not we may not think that is a knowledge making thing but when the results of the travels got transferred into records manuals gazetteers census reports things like that it became sites of power and that was used by the british government they were not villains but they were looking at indian environment as a site for expansion of an emerging capitalist economy there was more economics in that sir in that than philosophy than culture economics you know because 
english uh, the english people were becoming a number one capitalist country in those days because they championed industrial capitalism they came to india because of capital at their disposal and the 18th that great 19th century and the later uh, the first uh, the 20th century uh, was a period when uh, the whole of the world was unified by the global market economy controlled in many ways by british capital and industries that politics how it damaged in indian environment that's what i was trying to explain and uh, <coughs> see uh, the the second question whether the uh, the governments came with certain measures and whether i am happy with the governmental intervention in uh, ameliorating this environmental crisis is a different question which uh, to which i am i can say with 100% certainty that very very poor performance by the governments in power the politicians you know they are concerned about it only in certain seminars and workshops more minds are coming up more industrial enclaves are coming up because you see they are not confronting uh, the poor people but they are confronting the forces of capitalism like wallerstein says capitalism has become a world system you are thinking in terms of an epistem that is the epistem of liberalization of economy the culture industry all things like that politician is also a part of that he is not a separate entity in that sense but one thing is sure that since 1970s there is a consciousness basically even though un has its own politics in that sense the convening of the first uh, summit on environment the stockholm summit in 1972 and this speech the great speech delivered by indira gandhi that poverty is the greatest pollutant in india so we were exposing that indian environmental stand should be different from that of the european because indian environment was reconfigured forcefully by the european so they have got a duty to contribute to the environmental restoration of india that is why in 1992 there was a separate earth summit parallel summit by the developing third world countries in rio de janeiro while the summit was going under un in 1992 the poor countries the developing countries they were con- convening a parallel summit so the politics also differs from that you know there in in the entire the globe there is a schism of environmental politics environmental politics of the first world and environmental politics of the third world and the developing nations our politicians comes under that framework well friends as a thanksgiving i can only make this statement an act is defined as good by our traditional way by the motives of the act even though the result of the act may not be that pleasant that is how we define whether an act is good or bad the european way of defining an act itself is the fruit of the act the motive of the act takes a but not a dominant note so looking at the action of the europeans we can say that they are motivated towards their personal ends rather than for the collective good so in this way the act of those people even though it looks apparently as bravery courage it's actually you can say exploitation of the simple and the uneducated now the second question or the second statement which i wish to make is if there is a pickpocket made irrespective of the country to whom the he belongs to pickpocketer the sufferer is the one who is been a victim of that pickpocketing irrespective of who has pickpocketed so before colonial our independence it is someone else now within our own men who are pickpocketing us so there cannot be something called good and bad soft and terror pickpocketing pickpocketing is a pickpocketing thing which we have to acknowledge there cannot be anything called uh, sinner and a saint in pickpocketing both are equally to be removed from our minds have a perfect what you can call a judicial mind in judging these acts thank you very much sir for sharing your thoughts with us on behalf of all of you and on behalf of the gokle institute i to look after for your further visits so that people here can enlighten their 
mental horizon and think in a more mature way and act in the same way thank you very much sir thank you so much and my wife is also here she has also joined me she is beena dr beena thomas she is a pharmaceutical science you know she belongs to the scientific rationality and i to the historic rationality <laughs> thank you sir thank you sir. Thank you so much.